supposed to be. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out today. I'm going to start a couple minutes early just because I could use the extra time. Wow. I pushed it. Yes, it's been pushed. You guys like your buttons in here. I would have thought. <laughs> it's all commandlet based. There should be a commandlet for that button. Um, so, yeah, my name is Joe Levy. I'm a program manager on the automation and integration team at Microsoft. So, I work on orchestrator and service management automation and system center and Azure Automation, which is a service in Azure and part of the new operations management suite. And I'm going to, I have a lot of slides on here, but given time and uh, given what you guys are interested in, which is demos, I'm going to mostly focus on that. Anatoly's going to join me a little later. He's a developer on Azure Automation. Um, essentially what I'm going to talk about today is Azure Automation, you know, what it's great for, a whole bunch of new features we're introducing basically today. Um, what you can do with it, what others are doing with it, and uh, basically why it's great and why you know any PowerShell you're writing should really be you know moved when you're ready for production into the Azure Automation Service and how it'll really help you perform management at scale in a much easier way. Uh, so, how many people in the room are familiar with the Automation Service, Azure Automation? What about how many who are using it? Okay, and SMA. Okay. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Azure Automation is a highly available, scalable, reliable workflow and PowerShell DSC uh, execution engine in the cloud. Uh, and it lets you automate all the manual, long-running, frequently repeated, uh, and error-prone steps you take to keep your cloud and your data center up and running. Um, really calling it Azure Automation is a little bit of a misnomer because the service itself sits on top of Azure. It is a cloud service, but it can automate a whole bunch more than Azure. You can automate Azure, AWS, on-prem, OpenStack, VMware, you know, really anything you want, it's able to, to reach into and, and touch and automate and integrate between them. Um, who's familiar with the operations management suite? Don't feel bad if you're not, it's very new. Uh, operations management suite is essentially system center delivered as a service. Uh, so no installing anything, no maintaining anything, or installing patches. You just sign up for the service. The licensing is very similar to System Center. You get access to ser services very much like the products in System Center, but as services. Um, right now in, in Operations Management Suite, we have Op Insights, which is uh, log analytics, things like that. Automation, which is the service I'm going to be talking about today. And uh, Azure Site Recovery, which is great for recovering cross sites or to Azure in the event of a disaster. And over time, more and more things are going to show up in Operation Management Suite, uh, including container management. Jeffrey talked about containers a little yesterday, uh, including you know, patching solutions, things like that. So really, all the management that goes into keeping all the systems on premise, and all the systems in Azure, and their integrations you know, working, keeping everything going, Operations Management Suite will be able to help you, help you uh, manage. So when I think about Azure Automation nowadays, I like to position it as PowerShell++ and PowerShell as a service. So to start with the PowerShell++ part, uh, essentially what you get with Azure Automation is all the greatness of PowerShell, including scripts, workflows, and con DSC configurations. Uh, but you get some added things on top. For one, you don't have to set up infrastructure, um, but even you know, more so than that, you get things like a centralized store for assets that's uh, secure, encrypted, so you can store credentials in there, variables, uh, certificates, and not have to worry about, you know, are you storing them in a secure way. You can store variables in there, encrypted or not, and basically all these items you store in there, you just reference from your different DSC configurations or from your uh, PowerShell runbooks, uh, so that they're kind of resolving the values from the asset store instead of hard coding those values all over the place and maybe in an insecure way. Um, another thing you get out of our centralized store is uh, reliability and uh, resumability. So until today, we're going to introduce a new feature today, but until today, runbooks were all PowerShell workflows. And PowerShell workflow gives you the ability to, for one, you get to do things in parallel very easily, but you also get the ability to checkpoint, suspend, and resume. And what uh, Azure Automation adds to that is anytime you checkpoint in a runbook, that's stored in our centralized store. So if the runbook fails due to a network error or a sandbox where the runbook was running error or a logic error, 
we can restore that runbook from the place where it left off, from that last checkpoint, could be on a completely different machine connected to Azure Automation. So really reliable execution in the face of failures, where even if the machine disappears where it was running before, we can still continue <coughs> running it somewhere else. Um, and you get other things like our, our scheduling engine. We added webhook support in May. Uh, draft and publish versioning so you can work on the runbook while the production version of the runbook is still running on schedules and being started by other runbooks and things like that. And then of course it's also, you know, highly available, scalable, and manageable. Um, and by that I mean you get a, for example, for DSC you get a pull service hosted in the cloud. No more setting up a pull or reporting service. You just set up an, an automation account by clicking one button and then you have a, a pull service set up. Um, and we have full REST API, .NET SDK, commandlet support, and a portal for managing all this stuff, for starting <laughs> runbook executions, for viewing what output came out and what jobs came out, um, for everything, basically. Everything you can do around PowerShell management. And I think one of the, the big selling points is that historical analysis. So and, you know, right now, if you run, transcripting helps with this a bit, but right now, if you run PowerShell scripts on premise, you, know, you don't really know who ran what where and what output came out. In Azure Automation, you know, everything is, is logged. We know who started things, when they were started, what input they took, what output they produced. Um, and same around DSC. So you get uh, high level and granular reporting on which nodes are in compliance with the desired state. If they're not in compliance, what exactly is out of compliance or fit, why did something fail to become compliant. So a lot of rich reporting around your, all your PowerShell assets, scripts and DSC. Uh, and then there's the as-a-service aspect. And what I mean by that is basically, I stole this slide from Mark, um, but I, I filled in the details with my own details. But this, he, he came up with this, so he gets credit for that. Um, by simplicity, I mean you don't have to install anything. You just hit a button and you have an execution engine for PowerShell that can run across device. You know, we were talking about Power yesterday and now you can access it from your phone. Um, this even more so than that. You can access it from anywhere because it's, it's in the cloud. Uh, but it's still secure, you know, there's still authorization and uh, authentication you need to go through to access things. But you don't have to install anything, um, you don't have to maintain anything, and you don't even have to pay to use it. We give you 500 free minutes a month, which is a lot in terms of an automation engine executing something. So you can do a lot of stuff for free, or if you're an enterprise and you use more than 500 minutes, you still have enough to really try it out without having to commit to paying anything. Um, it scales up as you need it to, so if you suddenly need to manage way, way, way more systems, all it is is just run more jobs and uh, you pay for what you use. Uh, in the operation management suite, the, the uh, way you pay is more aligned with the system center licensing though. So there is pay as you go in the Azure way and then there is the kind of operation management suite licensing uh, as well. So whatever licensing works for you there. Uh, Another thing I want to emphasize is new features frequently and automatically. So today, if you want new features, I mean, we're getting better about releasing things, quick, things quickly all across Microsoft. Jeffrey talked about that. Um, but it still can involve installing something yourself. You don't have to do that with Azure Automation. You just, the new services, the new features show up without you having to install or patch anything. They're just in there and you get access to them automatically. And so for those of you who have raised your hand before and are using Azure Automation, if you go into the Azure Automation portal today, it's actually a whole bunch of new features that you've just gotten lit up without you having to do anything. And uh, ubiquity, so we have regions all over the world, China, a bunch in the US, Japan, Asia, um, Southeast Asia, and more things lighting up soon. And you have the ability to automate behind uh, the firewall on premises if you want to do that as well. So Azure automation is able to touch you know, anything. Okay, so. That's the, the thickest amount of slides in a row we'll go through. Um, so it seemed like there were a, a handful of you who hadn't experienced Azure Automation at all yet. So what I'm gonna do is go to the correct screen, and then I'm gonna just do a quick walkthrough of Azure Automation and show you some of the things in there. Okay, so the first thing you get when you log into Azure Automation is your account dashboard. So this is the new preview portal of Azure. See, it's very pretty, everything slides. Um, for better or for worse. And uh, so you can see one of the things I talked about was the asset store, where you can store things securely and in a way where you can reference them from other runbooks. So for example, I've gone and I've created a variable called PowerShell Summit, uh, which you can't see the value of. It's a secret. 
um, but I can reference this within a runbook and get that value within, within the runbook or from multiple runbooks. And if I ever change the value, I only have to change it in one place, my asset store, rather than go around to a whole bunch of scripts, find wherever I used it and change it there. Uh, so I'm gonna just kick off a simple runbook that I've created. Um, so I wrote this runbook, I just called it PowerShell Summit. Uh, you can see we have an editor in the portal. So if you, you can use the ISC or Visual Studio if you want to. You can also just, if you're on another device or if you just wanna make quick edits, you can edit in the portal. Uh, we have some, you can see we have syntax highlighting. There's some uh, IntelliSense support. We also have uh, access to show you exactly what you have in your environment. You now you can see I have all these PowerShell modules in here that I can use. Uh, other runbooks I can reference if I wanted to inline call another runbook. And then assets, for example. So let's actually insert that PowerShell sign. You can see I have it here already. But if I delete that and I go into variables and I found, find PowerShell Summit and I just hit add get variable, it just inserts the code for me. And it'll do that for everything. So all the commandlets that are in there, it'll actually insert the stub for you so you can see What's the command look called? What are all the parameters? What are the types? What's optional? What's not? And it'll just insert that into the editor for you. You can perform tests in here. So I could go over to the test pane. You saw it took in a name parameter. So I could say Joe and I could hit start. And then that'll start a test up. And what's nice about tests is they run independently from, it's still a real execution. So if this was going to go and delete 10 VMs, it would still delete 10 VMs. But what it does is it separates it out from production jobs, or the production version, the published version of the runbook. And that means I can do things like uh, start the runbook on a schedule and still make edits to it and you know work on it and save the, my test, my draft version, but still have that production version, still get started on schedule, still get started by other runbooks, things like that. Um, so if I wanted to start you know, a real version of the job, I can hit start on the runbook. It creates a job. You can see for the jobs, you can view the list of all jobs that executed, what status they're in, when they were created, when they were last updated. Um, this one completed already, for example, so if it had errors or warnings or verbose logs, those all show up in here. Exceptions would show up. You can see the input it took and the output it produced. So in this case, it was a very simple runbook. Uh, when I ran this, you can see my input for name was PowerShell Summit. So it said, hello, PowerShell Summit, and then the asset value for that PowerShell Summit variable I was showing you contained PS rocks, and so it output that. So very easy to get started. You just go in here and you write PowerShell workflow. Today we're introducing PowerShell script, which I'll talk more about later. Um, and you just run things normal PowerShell, but you get a more manageable interface around it. So that at scale, when you're running hundreds of, of jobs and managing tons of DSC nodes, you really have a manageable interface to manage all this, make changes, things like that. And I think that's what I'll, I'll start with for my demo of Azure Automation, basically. PowerShell execution environment, API back, portal backed. <coughs> um, in terms of what some people are actually using Azure Automation for today, um, these are just some of the things we talk about. A lot of people, the biggest scenario is starting and stopping VMs. Uh, so a lot of people have dev test VMs in the cloud where during the day they're using them for dev tests, but at night, they're just paying for you know, compute they're not using. So they have runbooks that, very simple runbook, just goes on a schedule and <coughs> at night it turns it off, turns all those VMs off. In the morning it turns them all on. A lot of companies save a boatload of money doing this uh, and you know, keeps them off on weekends. And you know, something as simple as that where it might even not take you much time to do it manually, depending on how many VMs you have, but you may forget. And this way, there's no one person responsible for that. It might be on vacation or one machine where this is running that's responsible for that. It's just you schedule it to happen at a certain time, and it just happens with no person responsible uh, and no one computer that could you know, crash or something responsible. So really reliable execution of your PowerShell. Uh, other things people are using it for, a similar scenario around Azure HD Insight, where you can get a lot of value from HD Insight, but it's very expensive. So only having it created when you need it and deprovision when you don't need it. So having automation kind of uh, either schedule that or just at certain times based on uh, kicking off the Azure automation, start runbook API, you know, starting up uh, an Azure HD Insight cluster. Some people are managing their SQL servers uh, so that if the server is approaching its maximum load, they go and clean up uh, some old records they don't need anymore or some you know, logs on the SQL server to make more room. Um, and we have people using it for SharePoint Online just to monitor certain uh, 
thresholds, certain quotas, and if uh, those are hit, actually going and you know alerting uh, live site engineers to go in and perform some uh, remediation tasks. And some of those remediation tasks are actually automatically handled by automation. So it can do the monitoring of some system. If it sees some action to take, it can do automated remediation. So I talked a little before about, I'm sorry it's getting cut off a little bit, about um, new features and how we, as Jeffrey talked about, we're iterating a lot quicker. You know, it's not years that you wait between features anymore. It's months, sometimes it's days. And with services, you don't even have to do anything on your side to get those new features. They just appear. Um, in May, so four months ago, we introduced a whole bunch of new great stuff. Uh, Azure China support, graphical runbook authoring, which Anatoly is going to talk about in a second. Uh, hybrid runbook workers, so allowing you to, behind your firewall and your data center, still have <coughs> Azure automation kind of orchestrate the, the PowerShell that runs on premises. Webhook support, so having systems like GitHub and things like that, which can basically, upon some event happening in the system, call a URL. That URL can be Azure Automation, and it can start a runbook just in response to, for example, a GitHub commit. Um, Azure Automation DSC's private preview. I'll talk more about Azure Automation DSC later. We introduced a REST API. We introduced some more PowerShell commandlets. We have about 70 PowerShell commandlets, so everything you can do in the service, you basically have PowerShell commandlets for, uh, as well as ARM template support, so the ability to kind of declaratively say, this is how I want. I want these runbooks in the system. I want uh, it in this region, and I want these jobs to kick off only after you know this SQL database is deployed and all that dependency mapping you can do with Azure Resource Manager templates. Um, so now I'm going to have Anatoly come up and just talk for a minute about graphical authoring, which is a feature we introduced in May. Right. Uh, uh, we don't have time for a demo of this, uh, but I just wanted to explain why we are doing this uh, specifically to this audience. Uh, in Graphical Runbook, you can uh, create a program uh, visually by selecting activities, connecting them uh, with links, uh, and um, this becomes a self-documented program that is very easy to understand what uh, it is doing. Um, however, at this point, uh, hardcore PowerShell developers normally get skeptical because you are comfortable reading and writing PowerShell code uh, you don't need maybe to hide uh, complexity too much and this uh, just feels like uh, too many mouse clicks. Uh, so why are we doing this? Uh, mouse clicks are not the point. You don't have to uh, actually use a mouse to create uh, runbooks like this. Uh, and uh, these uh, runbooks, they are not a replacement for plain PowerShell. They are meant to coexist and cooperate. Uh, for example, you can have a set of uh, scripts that perform specific tasks uh, written in plain PowerShell uh, and have a high-level parent runbook that invokes those scripts uh, and makes it easy to understand. Uh, so why uh, would you uh, even use that? The new programming model, uh, it is slightly different from PowerShell. We uh, love PowerShell, we embrace uh, PowerShell concepts uh, and we take some of them a little bit further. Uh, for example, we love PowerShell pipeline. Now imagine PowerShell pipeline uh, that you can split at any point uh, and have parallel branches with the pipeline data automatically propagated to all the branches. You can merge those branches uh, and uh, this is as easy as creating proper links between activities. Uh, in general, uh, the new programming model allows you to communicate your intent uh, on a higher level more directly. And this makes it possible for, first of all, it makes your uh, life easier, your programs simpler, but also it helps our service to help you even more. Uh, we can we don't just uh, execute commands you provide in your runbook blindly. We uh, can look into the structure of what you are trying to do. Uh, we can wrap those commands into something else. And this sounds simple, but allows us to do uh, amazing things like uh, we can uh, keep track of the data flows and provide the data you are most likely interested in uh, during debugging and troubleshooting. 
uh, we can repeat execution of any command if it fails, for example, automatically. Uh, during debugging, we can uh, return to any previous step and resume execution from there, <coughs> potentially with different data. Um, so, uh, if uh, you think it is relevant to you, this feature is uh, available uh, in preview, but uh, there is still lots of work to do. And if you think this is relevant to you, please contact us, uh, ask questions, influence us. Thank you. Thanks, Anatoly. So Anatoly actually developed this. He's very passionate about it. And I, I think it, uh, it's a good thing to be passionate about because, I mean, there's different ways of performing your automation. There's, there's PowerShell. There's PowerShell wrapped graphically. There's PowerShell workflow. There's other languages like Python, really, you know, anything. Um, and there's pros and cons to each, and so this is just another option for you to choose from when you're writing runbooks that can be useful for a lot of the reasons Anatoly mentioned, um, and has some cons as well. So it's really you know up to you to figure out for your organization what's most useful to you, um, what's easiest for you, things like that. And this is just another option that looks really cool, and for people coming from the orchestrator world especially, you know, is a very good corollary of how you bring people using orchestrator over to this PowerShell world where Behind the scenes, we're still, you know, in this case, executing PowerShell. Um, but it allows them to s create things graphically and maybe for managers of people who write PowerShell. The managers maybe not understand reading your PowerShell, but they'll be able to understand something like this. So, yeah. Can you uh, have a workflow for the estate configuration as well? Like, depends, like, set up different mm -hmm. uh, resources within the, work the graphical workflow? Because I know I have a lot of customers that don't want to do because they're scared of the scripting and oh, well, PowerShell. Yeah. But, uh, if they had a graph graphical interface like this, if they have resources, mm -hmm. I, and then have a workflow there. So the question was, can I graphically construct my DSC <coughs> configurations? Um, the answer is right now you can't in Azure Automation, but it's something on our backlog, and the fact that we've proven it out with pure PowerShell script, uh, it should even be easier with a declarative language. Um, so it's definitely something we want to look into because that is, you know. Uh, a, a hold up point for some people is they, they know the desired state they want nodes to match um, but maybe they're not so good at writing that out in PowerShell so it's one area we want to help there um, so that was May four months later we're adding today a whole bunch of new features that I'm really excited to present here because they, they really all have ties into PowerShell um, gallery support with a uh, PS Get, or PowerShell Gallery, and with uh, Script Center. Um, PowerShell Script Runbooks instead of Workflow Runbooks. PowerShell IC add-on to make authoring runbooks locally and exactly the same as authoring runbooks in our system. Um, the public preview of Azure Automation DSC, as well as source control support. And then we have some other things as well, which I won't touch on too much in this presentation, but you should def definitely look into. Um, so I'm going to do a few demos. And each demo is going to use about two of these new features. So the first two I want to go through is the PowerShell IC add-on and uh, source control. So the PowerShell IC add-on, today a lot of people don't want to use our editor for authoring, um, either because they're comfortable in the IC or there's slight differences between and performance differences between authoring in our portal versus authoring locally. There's debugging locally, whereas we don't have debugging in our Azure Automation portal right now, for example. Um, but there's some things you have to work around because some things only exist in automation uh, right now. So the asset store, for example, on-premises in the IC, there's no such thing as an asset store. Um, but we have one in Azure Automation. So how do you actually use assets when you're writing runbooks locally? It's, you know, people can munge some things together there, but it's, there's not really a way to do it. So this, the IC add-on introduces the ability to actually create assets locally, edit them, including encrypted assets, which are stored on your machine encrypted in a secure way, uh, and the ability to use those within runbooks script or workflow runbooks you write locally. We actually added script support to this today. Um, and uh, the ability to sync these runbooks and these assets up into Azure Automation either via source control, which I'll, I'll demonstrate as well, or via, you know, just say, publish that as a draft, or put that as a draft in Azure Automation, upload these assets into Azure Automation. So it makes it really easy to go between uh, your production Azure Automation environment and a local editor that actually matches kind of the runbook execution environment. 
And then source control support, we actually now support the ability to uh, check things into GitHub and sync those changes straight into an Azure Automation account from GitHub, and as well as make changes in Azure Automation to a runbook and check that in from there, and those changes will go into GitHub as well. So kind of two-way source control syncing, which makes it easy to move between move your runbooks, between automation accounts, makes it easy to kind of have a DevOps workflow around your automation where you have continuous integration, uh, or you can very easily see what changes were made every time a, a change was made to a runbook, things like that. Who made it, what's the diff, things like that. So the demo I'm gonna show here is uh, one around starting and stopping of Azure VMs, since that is one of our most popular scenarios. Uh, so I will actually do that in the IC. Okay, so I have this GitHub repository um, and this contains, you can see it has two runbooks in here, and, and one of these runbooks has a bug. So what I'm going to do is actually edit it, fix it up locally, test it locally, and then put it into Azure Automation. So the first thing I'm going to do is in Git, I'm just going to pull and get uh, any changes that I don't have yet. I'll pull them down. And then I'm going to, in the ISC, you can see we have the, uh, this ISC add-on for Azure Automation now, where I can sign in and it'll actually start syncing and uh, letting me manage between uh, one or more Azure Automation accounts and locally. Nice thing down here, I don't know if you can see this, the, uh, the gears spin when it's doing something. <laughs> so you, you can tell when something's happening. So there we go, okay, so it's hooked up to my PowerShell Summit Automation account. If I go over to the Runbooks tab, I can see what I have locally versus in the Azure Automation or in both. So you can see this one is updated locally, this one only exists in the cloud, and these two only exist locally. Uh, and then I can see when they were last modified in each place. I can also see that for assets. So for my uh, for variables, for example, that PowerShell Summit variable is in there. Um, the reason it's red is we don't actually pull down credentials. Our service doesn't support doing that. So you can actually pull it down, but it won't have the encrypted value. So all these are encrypted variables. So you have to actually enter the value locally once um, because for security, we're not letting you pull them out of our service, even though you can set them in the service. So that's why it's red. So, but, so for example, for a later, de later demo, I have this AWS cred in there, which I've actually already set locally as well. And you can see it's in sync, so I have access to it locally. So anyway, I'm going to open this Azure, stop Azure VMs runbook, which had that bug. Uh, you can see this is a PowerShell workflow runbook. We'll talk about script runbooks later. You can see it's just getting one VM. It's going to grab an automation credential from the asset store, uh, use that to connect to Azure, and then just stop it. In this case, in parallel, just because I wanted to show a workflow feature. Uh, the bug was someone had commented that out, so very easy bug to, bug to fix. <laughs> I assume your bugs are a little more difficult. Um, so now I've updated that locally. Let's actually try to run that locally. So I'm, I'm declaring that. And then now it's, it's compiling that so that I can actually run it. There we go. Um, stop as VM. So then I can run this PowerShell workflow locally. It's actually going to fail. And the reason it's going to fail is because I haven't actually, I have no asset called Azure Creds, right? And you can see it says that in here, local value for PS cred, Azure credentials not found. And so the runbook fails. So what I can actually do is locally create this Azure creds credential. Oops. And the username, I, I'm going to give it a user that has <coughs> access to my Azure subscription. So this guy, for example. And then uh, for the password, I'll just put in the password for that user. Now you can see we have another credential asset defined locally. You can see the sync status is local only because I, haven't act I don't actually have it in automation yet. Um, and I can show you that by going to my asset store in here, clicking on credentials, and you can see that AWS cred that showed up locally as well as there, but the Azure cred is not because I haven't actually I declared it locally, but I haven't synced it up yet. 
anyway, so now that we've declared that I can actually run this runbook locally and it should actually work now, using automation activities, using an asset store locally. Okay. Um, and just while that is running, I also want to show you uh, that I actually have two VMs that are up and running now. And the one that's going to stop is this one, a VM to test two. So it looks like it's taking a second to run. But so anyway, while that's happening, what I can do from here, for example, is if I tested this and it's working, which you'll see it's working in a second, I can click on this guy, one or more of these if I want, and I can hit upload. You can see the gear starts spinning, and now my Azure cred says in sync. And if I go to Azure Automation, and I let the page reload, hmm. oh, there it is. Okay, Azure cred. So it's, it's synced this up from locally. So I can entirely write runbooks and create assets locally and just sync all that up. And in terms of syncing runbooks, Let's see, okay, so it looks like it finished. The run book I was testing locally finished. So now if I go to virtual machines, this page doesn't auto refresh, so I'm gonna need to reload the page, but you'll see that that VM is now stopping. So my run book worked locally, and I'm gonna actually move that run book into Azure Automation. Let's see. Come on. There we go, stopped. So the runbook did work locally. Really, it's just a PowerShell workflow to work locally. That depends on some assets. Uh, I uploaded my Azure creds uh, asset. So now when I, when I sync up this stop Azure VMs runbook, I can either just upload it as a draft and then um, test it, test the draft in Azure from here. Or in this case, I'm actually gonna use source control just because I wanna demo that as well. But it all depends on what you wanna do. You can either go the source control route or you can just you know, directly sync in from here and even start test jobs and see the output of test jobs that are running in Azure Automation straight from here. Um, so, but I'm gonna use source control. So now when I go to Git, you can see I've modified stop Azure VM because I fixed that very simple bug. So let's actually add that and commit it. Authentication failed. Hmm. Let's try that again. <coughs> okay, that time it worked. So now I've updated in source control this runbook to be correct. I can go into Azure Automation now, and uh, you can see on your automation account dashboard, you can set up source control. I've actually done that already. Very easy to do, it's just an OAuth flow where you give us access to your GitHub and select a repository and a folder to sync runbooks to and from. And then I can just hit sync, and then it'll actually start syncing anything in that GitHub repository, in that folder that's a runbook into our system. And you can actually see any of these sync jobs as just like they're you know, runbook jobs in our system. So if it did produce an exception or an error, wasn't able to sync for some reason, the way you debug that is the same way as you debug one of your you know, run books. You can see the errors and the exceptions also up in here. Uh, and then just to show you on the other side what we can do, uh, I can actually edit a run book in here and then check it in. So if I decided this should, instead of being high, be by, I can save that and then I can hit check in. And then again, that'll kick up a source control job that again, I can click into and view its status and see if it had any errors or exceptions uh, in the same place. So if I go into, oops, not there. So you can see I have sync to GitHub, sync from GitHub. So those both are there. And if I go over to source control, you can see the, this runbook has indeed been updated in here, so now it's just a matter of syncing it into uh, in here. So while that's running, just another thing I, I forgot to talk about earlier. So I didn't mention the operations management suite much. I kind of talked about what it was, but this is what it looks like. So you can see I have a whole bunch of different uh, data syncing into op 
and this a lot of these are from op insights so different pieces of data and they would show alerts on that or change tracking or configuration assessment in here um, you can also see automation is hooked up in here so you can see in this case just what run books I have, what jobs I have, but clicking into this would take you to our automation portal where you can do more of the details. But this is what the kind of all up operations management suite uh, portal looks like across those different system center in the cloud services. So let's see how we're doing here. Okay, this one's running. So this should complete pretty quickly, and this is the one syncing from GitHub. So what we should see is that runbook that didn't exist before, Stop Azure VM, should now show up in our system as a runbook. Not quite yet, it looks like. <clears throat> now they're both running. Oh, does that say completed? Yeah. Did say completed. Okay, so now if I go to my runbooks list. So there it is, stop Azure VM synced in through source control. And then I can go and test this in here. Just to show you from the ISV, um, you know, I could have uploaded it from a draft here straight into the automation account and then kicked off a test job if I wanted. So uh, you can see I now have updated in cloud because I recently downloaded in the cloud. Uh, yes? Are you able to prevent uh, sync from the ISV? Teams have chosen to go the sort of continuous integration route through source control. Um, the question was, can you prevent direct syncing if they if you've chosen to go through source control as your way of syncing between automation accounts or local and Azure Automation? Um, the answer is right now you can't. Uh, it it wouldn't be just the ISC you'd want to restrict that from. It'd also be from the commandlets and from the C sharp SDK and the REST API and even the portal, right? Direct edits in the portal. Um, a feature we're working on is RBAC, uh, and one of the things you could maybe restrict would be that that um, function, right? The function to be able to direct edit an asset. Because if you turn that off, and the only way to actually make edits was through source control syncing, then that would be the only way, right? So I think in the future that's how we would accomplish that. Okay. Yeah. The IEC adding is planned also uh, for SMA. Uh, it's on the backlog right now. Um, it's definitely something that we're looking at for us tonight, yeah. Uh, second question, why do you choose uh, the ISE for that and not Visual Studio? Yeah, I was just kind of picking one first. Um, when we started down this route, it was just uh, where we saw more of our users using it. Since then, a lot of people, a lot of you guys have started using Visual Studio for PowerShell as well. Um, the way this is written, it shouldn't be very hard to port it to uh, a Visual Studio add-on, so it'll yeah, probably yeah. show up there as well. Oh, by the way, this thing is entirely open source, so if you guys wanted to make any of these edits, you know, it's all on uh, GitHub, and you're welcome to contribute. We already have a handful of forks, 20-something stars or follow watchers and stars. Um, so if there's anything tiny that you would really like in there, feel free to make the, you know, tiny change to, to light it up as well. Um, so just to show you, I can also upload draft from here. And then if I wanted to test the draft, I can kick off a run in Azure Automation from here. And then I can actually see the, uh, you know, the status and any streams that come out, almost as if it was just my local PowerShell uh, ISC console. So that is uh, source control and the ISC add-on. Makes syncing runbook changes from, from and to source control very easy, and authoring runbooks locally, uh, and then running them in production in the cloud very easy. All right, next thing I want to talk about, which I'm really excited to talk about, is uh, PowerShell script runbooks. So for those of you folks who use Azure Automation today, what would you say your biggest issue is? Do you want to give me one? Scripts. Scripts. And, and what, about, what about them? Compile time is fairly long. Yeah. Sessions. Compile time takes a while. So PowerShell workflows have an extra step, which is compile it so that it becomes a runnable form. Um, PowerShell scripts don't have that issue. So we skip the whole compile time perf thing that can cause runbooks to take a little while to start. Um, basically, compile time scales as your runbook gets larger and as you call more runbooks inline from your runbooks, like child runbooks. 
Um, with PowerShell scripts, since there's no compile step, no matter how big your runbooks are, no matter how many child runbooks they call, you don't have that, and they start, you know, basically in five seconds. Um, there's also the fact that PowerShell workflow is different from PowerShell script, and you get some advantages from PowerShell workflow, like the ability to checkpoint, suspend, resume, and easy parallelism. But maybe you aren't using those things, and you'd rather just very easily get started with the PowerShell knowledge you have today, rather than learn some of the PowerShell workflow differences from PowerShell. And you might have a whole bunch of scripts that exist today, and you just want to bring them into the system without having to make them PowerShell workflow compatible. So these make that very easy. Yes? Um, do your PowerShell scripts also support run spaces or jobs? The uh, question was, do the PowerShell scripts support run spaces for jobs? Uh, it's not something we've looked into at all. So I would say it's a try your own risk type of thing. Um, you want to kick off different PowerShell jobs from a PowerShell script runbook? Yes, so you can um, simulate the parallel. Mm -hmm. To simulate the parallelism. My guess is it wouldn't work. If you wanted to get the same kind of parallelism you get in, work, in workflow, I'd suggest uh, kicking off asynchronous runbook jobs instead of trying to start them in the same sandbox as this job. Um, but yeah, so that is one of the things. I mean, you have to figure out, you know, is, is start time very important? Is bringing in existing knowledge and scripts very important? Or are checkpoints, suspend, resume, and parallelism very important? You know, there may be some workarounds for some of the things in the script world. Um, but at least now you get the choice, right? So you get to decide which of those things is more important to you and, and you know, take advantage of both for the scenarios where it makes sense. Um, they're basically the exact same as other runbooks. The only difference is when you create them, you select PowerShell. Um, we don't have hybrid support for them yet, but that's coming very soon. Uh, and right now, workflow runbooks, so graphical and, and textual PowerShell workflow runbooks, can only inline call other graphical and PowerShell workflow runbooks. And script runbooks can only call script runbooks. So that's one limitation we have right now, which we may uh, fix in the future. But if you're actually using our commandlets to start another job in Azure Automation, I mean, that's an asynchronous, that's a new job. So you can, in that way, start run, you know, whatever runbook you want from whatever runbook. Uh, question? Yes. Um, is it planned for SMA also? Yes, so the, the two biggest things we have on the SMA uh, list are the IC add-on and script support. Okay, any time frame? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no time frame, but they're actively being investigated. <laughs> okay, um, another thing I want to talk about that we have support for today is gallery. So you can go to the PowerShell gallery, find a module, and just click on this Deploy to Azure Automation button and it'll add it into your Azure Automation account just like that. We also have the ability to, in the, new, in the old Azure Automation portal, the old Azure portal, you have this gallery which will let you see everything on Script Center and easily import those into Azure Automation. You now have that in the new preview portal as well, and it also supports uh, script runbooks. So all the scripts that are already on Script Center uh, basically will show up in there, and you can select one and just bring it in as a script and, and run it as a script runbook. So we already showed stopping uh, Azure runbooks. I figured since I said Azure Automation can manage cross-cloud and on-premise, the next thing I'd show was stopping AWS runbooks. Sorry, stopping AWS VMs. They don't have runbooks. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do here is actually click on Browse Gallery on my runbooks list. This bring up this should bring up this uh, view of basically all of the different PowerShell workflows and PowerShell scripts on Script Center, and then I can search for whatever I'm looking for. So let's see if anyone wrote anything for AWS. Uh, it looks like this great guy, whoever he may be, has written. Wrote, wrote, written, written a runbook for uh, stopping AWS VMs. So I can, without importing it, I can see what it looks like all from here. I can see the amount of ratings it has and the amount of downloads. Apparently I have zero out of five. I think if you have no ratings, that's what it says. So that may be a bug, because I'm sure this is a great runbook. Um, so I can hit import, and then just you can see it's a PowerShell runbook. I can hit OK. And then that'll just uh, show up in my system. There it is. And you can see you can distinguish between PowerShell workflow and PowerShell script runbooks and graphical runbooks, which have a different icon as well, uh, based on this icon in here. 
And when you click into a runbook, it'll also tell you the type as well. Not that you really need to know. Only the editor really needs to know what the language of the runbook is, the person, the operator who's running it. To them, all runbooks are basically have the same management, the same life cycle. Okay, so let's actually look at this runbook. You can see it stops one or more VMs, and it depends on this PowerShell module, so I'm actually going to go and um, import that PowerShell module using that other functionality I talked about. So I hit deploy. I'm now on PowerShell Gallery. Sorry, I went through that quick. That was the PowerShell Gallery upload of AWS's PowerShell module. I hit deploy to Azure Automation, and then it'll, in here, basically ask me what Azure Automation account I want to bring it into. So I'll say an existing automation account. It's called PowerShell Summit. Uh, the location of the automation account is South Central US. And I'll pick the resource group of that automation account. And then it wants you to review some legal terms. You're actually not buying anything here, so we need to fix that. This is free. So and then I just hit create, and that'll import the module. I've actually already imported that module uh, earlier, just so we can go ahead so you can see the modules in there. And I've discovered all the 1,300 something command lists that are in there. So you can use those all very easily, very quickly in Azure Automation. Um, so then I can just go to stop AWS VM. Oh yeah, by the way, here's my AWS console. You can see I have two VMs running. This one is gonna stop one of them just because of how I've, I've written it. So I can hit, uh, just to show you the test pane, I can hit test and then I can hit that again. There we go. I can hit start. And then this should start very, very quickly. One, two, <coughs> three, four, four seconds. How nice is that compared to PowerShell workflow on books, right? So I'm running out of time, so instead of showing you that that will stop it, you'll just have to take my word for it. I'm going to move on to Azure Automation DSC. Um, Sounds like a lot of you are familiar with DSC already. If you're not, there's a ton of talks on it, so I'll let you learn from there. Uh, basically, what we give you in Azure Automation is a pull and reporting service where you just create an automation account, and you now have a pull service and a reporting service for DSC that you can onboard nodes to. Uh, we let you import configuration scripts, compile them into node configurations, which is just what we call MOFs, because MOF is a file type. We wanted to give it a name. Um, and then you can also import modules that contain DSC resources, and those go in our pull server as well so that they can be pulled by any nodes that you know, need a certain DSC resource that they don't have. Uh, and then you can register the nodes in a secure way with Azure Automation using the registration key and registration URL, which Don Jones talked a little bit about yesterday. Uh, and then they'll just pull things from us, and they'll report into us, and you can view in the UI or via command lines all those reports and things like that. Uh, today we're announcing the Azure Automation DSC preview. So there's some, the public preview, there's some pricing introduced for, uh, the, the GA pricing will be $6 a node a month where you pay at a daily rate. So if you spin up and down nodes day to day, you're only paying for that day $6 a month divided by, you know, 31 or something. Um, during preview, it's 50% discount, so $3. And we're introducing a whole bunch of new features, such as uh, a lot of improved UI, better reporting, making it very easy to onboard Azure VMs, uh, configuration data support, MOF encryption, um, importing MOFs you already have locally into the service, and uh, Linux DSC agent support, uh, which I was going to show, but we're basically out of time, and it actually stopped working this morning for some reason. So I'm going to instead just show you what our UI looks like. Uh, just to show you how cool it is. So you basically have a view of nodes and configurations in here. For any configuration in here, you can see what you see for oh. My description wasn't good enough? <laughs> <laughs> Let's try that again. There we go, okay. So I can see all the configurations I've imported, kind of just like runbooks. They show up in the same way. I can, just like I can start runbooks, I can compile configurations. They can take parameters. Uh, and then I get a view of my compilation jobs, which, you know, again, you can view the input they took, the configuration source at the time of compiling this into one or more MOFs, any errors or warnings or exceptions that occurred. And then that results, a compilation job compiling a configuration script results in one or more MOFs, node configurations, being put on our pull server. So you can see this one was for Linux, and it actually put two MOFs on our pull server. If we actually look at the source for this, 
you can see it's using uh, the NX DSC resource, which is for Linux. Okay, and uh, the uh, you can see it uses some Linux DSC resources in there. So you also see I can view you know the compliance state of my nodes. If it wasn't a failed or not compliant state, I can click into a certain report. I can look at all reports back in time. Right now, we just show you the raw contents of the MOF, or sorry, of the, the JSON report it sent us, but this will get much nicer in future releases. You can see in this case, the reason this failed is because um, I, had to, I tried to have it apply a feature called Weeb Server, which doesn't actually exist, so that failed. Uh, and then this one was not compliant because it was in a mode where it shouldn't continually become compliant, but it noticed that it doesn't have, in this case, IIS installed locally. Uh, so it's just saying, hey, I'm not complying with the state anymore. If you want me to be compliant, you know, you'd have to go to the VM and, and change it for you. If you instead have the machine in uh, uh, apply and autocorrect mode, it would basically continually become compliant with what had been assigned by the pull server. Oh yeah, the pull server controls what nodes get what uh, assignment, and you can actually change that server side. So if I suddenly decided this instead of being a web server was now going to be you know, something else, I can just select that and hit OK and it, uh, it'll conform the next time it pulls to that state. And just the last thing I wanna show, and then I'll let you guys out because I'm sure you're hungry, is we make it very easy to onboard nodes. We have like five different ways of onboarding nodes. You can, for Azure VMs, just select your VMs, one or more, and then just select you know, the LCM metadata you want it to match, uh, like how often it should pull, whether it should be an apply and monitor or just apply an autocorrect mode, and then you can hit go and it'll actually onboard those nodes in addition to a few other ways we have for Linux VMs, for on-prem VMs, for <coughs> Azure VMs, for AWS VMs. We have all kinds of ways of very easily getting nodes on. So I encourage you to try it out. I'm sorry I ran over time. I'll be outside of the room if you have any other questions. Uh, thanks for coming today.